Hello everyone and welcome to day five of our 30 day biology study challenge. Today we're going to be talking about surface area to volume ratio in cells, cell compartmentalization, and just the evolution of eukaryotic cells overall. Whether you're here for just a short refresher, a cram session, or you just want to learn some more biology, I'm glad you're here and thanks for sticking with us during this study challenge. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on every day of the 30 day study challenge. It's not an active studying strategy, but if you're consistent with your habits, it'll become easier to integrate them into your day, day after day. So these videos are eight, 10 minutes long. Go ahead and make a small habit of watching one every day for the next 30 days and you will be more prepared for your biology classes. Let's get started. Cells have membranes or special spaces that allow them to establish and maintain environments that are different from their external environments in order for certain cellular processes and reactions to occur. So overall, cells are comprised of different defined compartments. In eukaryotic cells, we know these as organelles. Each compartment has a specific function, and generally it is a eukaryotic feature, but there is some compartmentalization in prokaryotic cells as well, and scientists have found these in protein-bounded areas and lipid-bounded areas within prokaryotic organisms. But as we know, eukaryotic cells have well-defined compartments. Each part has a specialty for a particular function, and a lot of times when we focus on different processes within the cell, we focus on where they occur, whether that is within the plasma membrane, within the cytosol, or within membrane-bound organelles like our Golgi apparatus or our nucleus or our mitochondria. Let's take a quick look at prokaryotic organisms. So prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And why in general are cells so small? We know that as a cell increases in size, its surface area to volume ratio decreases. When we have not enough surface area to support a cell's increasing volume, a cell is either going to have to divide or it's going to die. Because we have a decreased rate of chemical exchange when the surface area to volume ratio is low, this results in death of the cell because the processes that the cell needs to perform can't perform at the rate that they need to. Again, if the surface area to volume ratio is too small, meaning we have not enough surface area to support the volume of the cell, the cell is not going to be able to support all of the chemical functions it needs to do. Cells need to stay a certain size in order to support all of these functions, so we want a greater surface area to volume ratio wherever we can. We'll see this theme come up again and again in different cellular structures, different tissues, as well as organs. Humans, for example, have a brain that has a good example of surface area increase with all of its folds and gyri and sulci. So why are organelles important and why do we even have them? Again, there are four compartmentalizations. Each particular compartment within the cell has a specific function it needs to perform. It provides a favorable local environment for metabolic reactions. Certain metabolic reactions have very low or very high pHs compared to the rest of the environment of the cell, which means certain enzymes within those compartments wouldn't function if they were combined in the rest of the environment of the cell. In order for the enzymes and other proteins to do the jobs that they need to do, they need to be in the environment that works for them. So the compartments can lead us to that. Cells have these membranes that allow them to establish and maintain our internal environments that are different from the external environments. We minimize competing interactions and we increase surface area where reactions can occur. For example, along the cristae, the folds of the mitochondria. And again, it could also protect different parts of the cell from potentially damaging metabolic reactions when the pH or byproducts of reaction end up being dangerous for the rest of the cell. So how did we get organelles? The theory of endosymbiosis is one of the most popular ones for how membrane-bound organelles evolved once from free-living prokaryotic cells. So this idea that chloroplasts came from free cyanobacteria within an environment that eventually were engulfed through phagocytosis and adopted a symbiotic relationship with larger cells. Later on, these became parts of the cell that were synthesized as the cell replicated as well. But that engulfing and then that symbiotic relationship we think was the origin of certain organelles such as the chloroplast and the mitochondria. We have evidence for this due to the fact that many of these organelles have a double membrane, so our phospholipid bilayer, just like the one that surrounds the cell. And so based on their size and the membrane structure, it's very likely that these organelles once were their own type of cell. Mitochondria themselves have their own DNA, another hint that they were once prokaryotic cells themselves. They also support energetic processes, and these internal membranes help with compartmentalization and efficiency within that organelle. 
Another skill that you'll need to know is how to calculate a ratio. This one is another pretty simple calculation, but you're just comparing one data point to another data point. So you're dividing data point A by data point B. So we would see this maybe in a situation where we're looking at surface area to volume ratio and comparing which cell might be more efficient in exchanging materials or removing waste by diffusion. So if we just look at these two cells, what we wanna do is see which one has the greatest surface area to volume ratio. And that'll be the cell that is more efficient. In this case, it's already given the surface area and volume volume, so you don't have to calculate those separately. But to calculate the rate, we just divide our first value by our second value, value A by value B. So in this case, that's 600 divided by 1,000 to give us 0 0.6. And then for our cell B, that's 5,400 divided by 27,000 to give us 0.2. In this case, cell A has the greater surface area to volume ratio, and so it is more efficient at exchanging materials. All right, let's get to some practice questions. Remember, if I go too fast through these, or if you wanna just mute me and look at the questions on your own, go ahead, or you can pause to think about your answer choices before I reveal them. A scientist calculated the relative surface area to volume ratios of four different digestive system cells. Which cell is most likely an intestinal cell with microvilli where high rates of absorption occur? Cell A, cell B, cell D, or cell C? Correct answer is, Cell A. Cell A has the highest surface area to volume ratio, which means there's gonna be more points for diffusion if nutrients can diffuse into the cell for absorption. As a cell's size increases, its ability to facilitate the movement of substances in and out, A increases, B decreases, C stays the same, or D depends on the organism. Think about it. Correct answer is B decreases. In general, as a cell grows, its volume increases at a faster rate than its surface area, which decreases the surface area to volume ratio. So when we have comparatively smaller surface area to the volume of all the things that are going on in the cell, it's gonna be more difficult for the cell to move substances in and out at a rate that it requires. This image shows two mitochondria in a human cell. It's taken with a TEM or transmission electron microscope. What is the purpose of the inner folds inside the organelles? A, increase volume for more energetic reactions. B, increase surface area for more energetic reactions. C, decrease surface area for more energetic reactions. Or D, decreased volume for more energetic reactions. Think about it. And three, two, one, answer is increased surface area for more energetic reactions. You guys are probably getting a hang of the theme by now. So remember mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, are where our cellular respiration reactions occur. And along those inner folds of the mitochondria, we have proteins embedded. And that is where we can establish proton gradients. We can get these reactions to happen that will generate ATP for the cells. So the more surface area, the more locations we have for that, and the more energetic reactions we can have within the organelle. Which piece of evidence does not support the theory of endosymbiosis? A, chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own DNA. B, chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own membranes. C, chloroplasts and mitochondria divide in a way similar to bacteria. Or D, chloroplasts are found in plant cells while mitochondria are found in plant and animal cells. Think about it. Correct answer is D, chloroplasts are found in plant cells while mitochondria are found in plant and animal cells. Although this is correct, this is a true statement, it does not directly relate to our pieces of evidence that support the theory of endosymbiosis. All these other things are pieces of supporting evidence. That's it for day five in our 30 day biology study challenge. Thanks so much for sticking with us up till now. Tomorrow we're gonna be in day six, which is membranes and cell transport. I'm really excited to keep moving forward with you. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.